But John G. Kramer is Emeritus Professor of Physics at the University of Washington. He's still teaching and conducting research in ultra-relativistic collisions at Brookhaven of um, heavy ions, which is where the real cutting edge is, and, they, and take that CERN, you can't do that. Um, John is also the originator of the transactional theory of quantum mechanics. Interpretation. Which is an interpretation of quantum mechanics, which is an alternative um, explanation to the standard Copenhagen model that was begun by Niels Bohr before World War II. Um, he's pursuing a University of Washington-based um, experiment using quantum optics to test possibilities having to do with uh, non-locality of information between two um, objects that began with, with parity, with, with, um, with a uh, standard relationship from when they were admitted from a uh, nuclear uh, decay or something like that and what their relationship would be when they are way, way far apart from each other and when, what uh, implications this might have for our basic notions of physical reality. John has also written hard SF novels, Twist Or, Einstein's Bridge. He has maintained the bi-weekly um, alternate view science column. Oh, bi-monthly. Bi-monthly. <laughs> in the, uh, he's also a professor, so he corrects his students regularly. Um, <laughs> Got to keep them straight. Even when it doesn't matter. The, uh, <laughs> the uh, bi-weekly column, bi-monthly column for the um, venerable and sometimes called venerable science fiction magazine Analog, um, which you all should subscribe to simply as an act of faith and to maintain this, this corner of arrogant uh, um, boys who never grow up sci-fi. Um, born and raised a Texan, John and his wife Pauline have three children, including my wife and very close friend, Catherine Kramer Hartwell, who is um, a major science fiction editor in New York City. And I consider John to be also a close pal. And so let's dive right in, because we have a lot to cover. Um, uh, so be brief on everything, John. Right. First uh, of all, an announcement. I brought a few copies of my first novel, Twister, and left them at the registration desk. So if there are any left, you might want to dash out and get one because they're not, I didn't bring very many. There, there aren't that many. <laughs> so, John, um, the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics has been at odds with relativity um, since its inception. Einstein uh, was all ticked off about it, even though he did go into the sandbox with Rosen and Podolsky and, and did play in the quantum mechanics sandbox. He nevertheless was very upset about the notion that uh, ever since Michelson and Morley's experiment found that the speed of light is the same in all reference pr frames, the speed of light has been sacred. You follow these light cones and you cannot see beyond where the light could have come in the time allotted. So the, all of the universe that we see is just, the light, is just the universe that's local according to light. And quantum mechanics suggests that in order to keep its accounting books balanced, that the accountant at one end has to be able to converse with the accountant at the other end yes. uh, in order to balance. Um, uh, if, if, if a, in order to keep this decay of this particle neutral and even, it must send, it sends out two photons in opposite direction to, to maintain zero momentum. They each must have the same polarization and it can be either linearly polarized or it can be circularly polarized and this particle here doesn't know which it's going to be until this guy measures it. Do I have that right? Yeah, that's right. The, the, this is called the problem of non-locality. And yeah, as you said, it came about because Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen, in particular Einstein, didn't like quantum mechanics. He thought that there was something fundamentally wrong with it. And, and, and he pointed out that there was this problem that when you separate two parts of a quantum system, because certain conservation laws have to be observed, what you measure in this quantum system affects the possible outcomes of the measurements over here. Uh, seemingly faster than the speed of light, and, and you can even arrange it to be backwards in time. And he thought that was a, 
uh, sort of a devastating criticism of quantum mechanics that it would never survive, and it, all, it was obviously wrong because of that. Subsequently, people uh, went into the, the laboratory and set up so-called EPR experiments to test this, and sure enough, it was there. The, the, the quantum mechanics does have this property of non-locality, that there is that, that's some kind of talky-talk between one measurement on one side and, the, and a measurement on the other side that uh, seems to be faster than light, or, or seems to be backwards in time, but nevertheless works and is part of our universe. And the wonderful irony of this is that Einstein made one of his greatest contributions while trying to make a silly, this is silly, here's a thought experiment showing you how silly your, your system is. Right. They then tested his thought experiment, found it to be completely true, <laughs> and he became a great icon uh, and father of modern quantum mechanics. So, yeah. so the, the thing is, the, the fundamental thing is, question is, you collapse the probability wave over here, it causes the probability wave to be constrained over here until an observer um, collapses it by looking. Right. But when that observer looks, what that observer sees is, is constrained by what happened over here. And this could be four light years away. Yeah, uh, so far it's been tested between Geneva and Bern, Switzerland over the Swiss tele telephone lines and demonstrated that at least over that distance, quantum non-locality non is really operating. And probably it, it will operate over light years. Um. Well, then the obvious question is, um, could people use this to communicate yeah. faster than the speed of light? <clears throat> exactly, and the, the, when people begin to realize it, that uh, quantum entanglement, you, you call it entanglement when these two things are together and then separate and there's still some connection between them. You, you say that that's an entangled system and the, the connection between them is called non-locality and, and people begin to wonder whether quantum non-locality could be used for communication. And uh, the conventional answer is no. And, and as a matter of fact, there are several sort of no signal theorems that people have, pro have shown with the, uh, using the formalism of quantum mechanics. Other people, however, have shown that there is something suspicious about some of the assumptions that went into these, uh, these proofs, and that if you look at them carefully, they, also, uh, they can also be used to prove that some certain other features of quantum mechanics don't exist, which really do exist, like Bose-Einstein symmetrization. So, so from my point of view, it becomes an experimental question. You should go into the laboratory and test it. And we came up with a really good way of, of doing such a test, and, and I, I'd like, like, which is in, in progress now, and I'd like to t uh, talk about that using, using slides. Yes, yeah, so could we have the first slide, please? Yeah. And okay, John, I'm going to have to walk to the end of the stage. John has promised to blaze. Well, you can see it right in front of you. Yeah, but I can't use the pointer. I, Does I, this I have a pointer? Yeah, this is a pointer. Okay. And, but I don't see it on the... Uh, yeah, okay. So this is an argon laser, which is producing a beam of ultraviolet light and going into a magic crystal over here, a so-called nonlinear crystal, uh, beta uh, <coughs> uh, barium uh, borate, uh, BBO. And... What happens is that a single photon goes in and two photons that have twice the wavelength and half the energy goes, come out. And basically, you split the photon in half and make two for the price of one, so to speak. And these are entangled photons. They're momentum entangled because the momentum of the two photons coming out have to add up to the, to the momentum of the photon that produced them. Uh, one of these is vertically polarized and the other is horizontally polarized. So they come along here and reach a beam splitter in which the vertically polarized photon goes to the right and the horizontally po fo polarized photon continues to go straight. Now, quantum non-locality is operating in this system and is connecting these two. And so what happens is that if on the, uh, on the right side here, you choose to let the photon go through both slits, then you get a quantum interference pattern, a pattern that looks like this. And if you look over here at the other photon, you see a quantum interference pattern there too. Even though it did not go through any slits, you see the same interference pattern there. So <clears throat> if you look, um, this pointer is not working very well, but if you, if you look, uh, when, when this photon goes through both slits, you see a pattern that looks like this. And that, this is an actual measurement done over here. If you choose to cause this particle over here to behave like a particle instead of a wave by, making, by blocking one of the slits and only letting it go through the other, then what happens is that the photon over here changes the pattern and becomes a single slit pattern. So basically, without having any 
signal going over to the second photon, you, uh, <clears throat> uh, you can either signal, you, you can either produce a two-slit interference pattern or one-slit interference pattern, depending on what you do to the other photon. Now, is this quantum communication? No, because these two, part of, these two photons are measured in coincidence. You only look at the ones over here when the ones over here are sending a signal to a gate that, uh, <coughs> that combines the two. So this is a, a suggestive experiment done by a, a group at the University of, of Maryland in 1995, <coughs> but it doesn't demonstrate uh, non-local communication. Uh, next slide. Next slide. Press the button. Uh, I don't think I have a button. They have it. <clears throat> this is another experiment done in 1998 which shows a similar thing. Uh, here we have an ultraviolet laser beam coming along, going through a nonlinear crystal and producing two photons, one of which goes, to the, goes along the upper path and the other goes along the lower path. Uh, the one that goes along the upper path goes through a lens and over here we have a place where we can detect the, the, the pattern of the photon that goes through after the, after the lens. If we go two focal lengths back, then we get an image which turns out to be the image of the slit present over here on the other side. And so you see a two-slit pattern. You can tell whether the, the photon went through the right slit or the left slit by whether it's in the upper bump or the lower bump in this figure. If you push the, le the detector forward, you get into a circle of confusion where the images of those two slits merge together, and what you see instead is a two-slit interference pattern. <clears throat> so if you move this lens back and forth, you can go between this pattern and that pattern. And what you observe in the lower part of the experiment is that when you're in this situation where, you, where, you're, doing, where you're measuring momentum, you see a, uh, an interference pattern. When you're in this situation, when you're measuring which slit the particle went through, you just see a broad diffraction pattern. What, what's, essentially, what's happening is that when the uh, detector is in this position, you're causing the photon to behave like a particle, and the one over here has to behave like a particle as well. If you push it forward and make it behave like a wave, the one over here has to behave like a wave as well. So you can semaphore back and forth this way and send dots and dashes, um, <coughs> modulating whether you get this pattern or that pattern over there. Again, this looks for all the world like non-local communication, <clears throat> but again, there's a coincidence requirement between the two. So the question is, can you design an experiment that el eliminates the coincidence requirement so that you can really send signals from one of these uh, photon beams to the other? Next slide. <clears throat> and this is, uh, this is the experiment that we're presently doing at the University of Washington. We're using some tricks that the people who did these things in the, in the, <clears throat> in the last cent uh, century didn't have advan the advantage of. First of all, uh, we have a periodically polled crystal, which um, uh, <clears throat> I won't go into the details of it, but basically it has a, it's a crystal where the electric field vector is wiped back and forth, back and forth every 10 microns to increase the efficiency of producing down-converted photons. The photons come along here. Again, one's polarized horizontally and the other's polarized vertically. One goes this way and one goes that way. And <clears throat> instead of having slits, we're using what we call a half-slit interferometer. This is a, uh, <clears throat> an, a new invention, basically, a modification of the classic mock zander interferometer, where instead of having a half-silvered mirror here, you have a, a so-called D-mirror, which sort of slices the beam in half, reflects half of it, and allows the other half to pass through. <clears throat> if you choose to take this, where does it go? <laughs> the, the splitter on, on the far side, which my laser pointer doesn't seem to be able to... Yeah, yeah there it is. <clears throat> this laser pointer is not working well, but anyway. <clears throat> uh, if you choose to take the prism on the far side out, then basically one, one detector is measuring a fo the photons on the lower path, and the other uh, detector is measuring the photons on the upper path, so you're causing particle-like behavior. You know that the photon went this way, or you know that the photon went that way. If you put the splitter in, then you make, measure quantum interference, and basically you're causing wave-like behavior. The photons went through both slits. And so the issue is uh, <coughs> that that's, the, that's your signal, uh, and over here is your uh, detector. You can tell, in principle at least, whether <coughs> the, uh, the, the prism over here is in the in position or the out position by getting one of these two paths. The, the advantage of using these interferometers is, is that slits throw away most of the light, these uh, interferometers use almost all of the light. So this is the... Uh, let's, uh, well, let's... This <laughs> is the thing we're testing right now, which is to try to see whether 
quantum non-locality can actually be used for communication. David. Dang, you uh, dived right through some wonderful slides and I want to examine them uh, personally uh, in, in closer detail later, but I think what the, what the, what the guys here at FIRE are most interested in is whether or not um, they're going to be able to uh, venture capitalize a time travel machine. Yeah, as, well, let me get into the possible. time travel thing now, okay? okay. Uh, suppose that on this interferometer that maybe is still on the screen, maybe it isn't. Uh, anyway, if you put a, uh, if you go down the highway looking for people who are pulling fiber optics, you see these giant orange spools of, of fiber. Uh, typically, those are 10 kilometer spools, and it takes about 50 microseconds for light to go in one, one end of such a spool and come out the other end uh, going along the fiber. If you put one of the, rolled one of those into the laboratory and put it uh, <coughs> into the line going to the so-called send interferometer, it would delay the, the sending operation for 50 microseconds with respect to the receiving operation. And so in principle, you could use that to send, uh, <coughs> send bits of information 50 microseconds backwards in time. In other words, you'd receive the information 50 microseconds before you sent it. Now, <coughs> I, uh, I've asked Mark, uh, uh, if, if one uh, uh, <coughs> pedals this to Wall Street, those 50 microseconds of time advance do you any good on the stock market? And he said, hell yes, that, uh, that <laughs> Goldman Sachs <coughs> moved, their, their, moved their server uh, closer to the, uh, <coughs> to, the, to the Wall Street server in order, in order to get, gain a, a, an amount of uh, time, time delay, uh, reduce an amount of time delay which was much smaller than that. For so. all we know, this <laughs> has actually been happening. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> the, now, now uh, speaking, speaking as the Bush, uh, no, that's the wrong word, the Bush League, the, um, the more uh, hard scrabble, lower grade um, P uh, PhD union card physicist here, I have to say that some of this stuff just simply boggles me. Um, we're, we're talking about several things here. One is faster than light is not exactly what we're talking about here. Uh, if you merely had tachyons that could go faster than light, you could violate time from the point of view of Einstein, an observer standing outside, uh, watching time, light interact, because light is all there is in the Einsteinian universe. But what's, what you're talking about here is not tachyons traveling faster than light. What you're talking about is, is a direct coupling between non-local events that could um, cause communication in theory, some theory, not only cause communication faster than light, but possibly even non-causal, meaning you backwards might, in time. You might be able to violate causality, which has all kinds of far-fetching far and, and we science fiction yes. authors <laughs> have played with that from time to time. There's some novels in which there's some super beings that prevent uh, you from having effects coming before their causes and bring their thumbs down on races that try to do that. Um, but there is another area that I think is uh, very hot, and we only have eight minutes left, that a lot of people are talking about these days, and that is quantum computing. Yes. Uh, the government is pouring lots and lots of money into it. You're talking about uh, quantum computing with one, two, three, four, now six qubits. In one minute, can you give us a, a gist of what the excitement is about? Well, okay, the, re the, the money is coming from the, basically from the National Security Agency who would like to use quantum computers to uh, crack encryption codes and read your email and fi figure out what's going on in, in, in various kinds of en encrypted messages that, that are going on. And th for the last decade or so, they've been pouring money into quantum, quantum computing and, and the uh, physics uh, uh, infrastructure behind it. Uh, very aggressively. Uh, we are probably a few years from having an operating quantum computer that, that will operate with six bits. There's one, uh, there's a three bit computer that I know about that's been achieved and, uh, and I'm not sure how, uh, I'm a little bit out of date, but, but one of these days we're going to have quantum computing. Uh, the well, question is, what's, what are going to be the implications of that? Well, there are a lot of things in the literature about using it for doing uh, 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 encryption cracking, for, for doing rapid lookup of vast databases and so forth. But the thing that I'm very interested in is, uh, and this is something that Richard Feynman pointed out many years ago, 
that if you have a quantum computer, you can, quantum, you can do quantum mechanical calculations correctly and accurately and fast. And that's something that we have not been able to do up to now. Multi-body uh, quantum, quantum mechanical calculations are a kludge, which we're not able to do very well, and we're only able to do with great difficulty. And uh, it will have really big implications for uh, understanding quantum physics uh, of multi-particle systems if we're able to have quantum computers, and, th and that would have all kinds of spin-offs. Compared uh, genomics pre and post Craig Venter. I mean, we're talking uh, ma many, many orders of magnitude of speed of doing quantum mechanical research. And of course, you know, this whole business of the inevitability that, um, that encryption will be broken by somebody was the original seminal reason why I started working on my book, The Transparent Society. Will technology make us choose between freedom and privacy? The uh, hopelessness of trying to hide from elites with encryption is, is really brought to bear by, by this uh, inevitability of quantum computing. There is another way to stay free, and I go into it in my book, and it has to do with, not with hiding from elites, but stripping elites naked but we won't go there right now. The point is that some people believe that these quantum computers, uh, the mathematics for how they work are a bit beyond me, but they, I, I know enough to be able to see that the equations balance. But various explanations for why quantum com, uh, uh, computers work include uh, the one by David Deutsch. He believes that there are many, many quantum computers. This little six-bit computer is connected to an infinite number of, of six-bit computers in parallel universes, all trying out different things. And when the answer coalesces in our world, we're, we're, we're getting the most massively parallel uh, computational result uh, ever possible. I know that you don't really approve of this um, the, hypothesis. The, yeah, this gets into the business of the interpretations of quantum mechanics. Basically, quantum mechanics was it was created as a mathematics that didn't have an underlying physical picture behind it and it had to be constructed after the fact. And the Copenhagen interpretation, which is sort of the don't ask, don't tell interpretation of quantum mechanics, is, was, the, was the main result of that. More recently, there's something called the many worlds or Everett Wheeler interpretation of quantum mechanics, which, is, which uh, explains a, a wave function collapse as having a quantum system split into many parts, and each of these parts is a new universe which represents one possible outcome of the quantum event. And so you, the universe is continually branching into branch universes over and over again. But your transactional um, yeah. interpretation um, says, no, there's just one universe. Uh, right. All yeah. it is, is My the feeling is that, the waveform. that the Everett Wheeler interpretation is what, what William of Ockham had in mind when he said that you shouldn't multiply hypotheses beyond necessity. But uh, in the transactional interpretation, you take the psi stars that are all over the place in the quantum formalism, literally as waves going backwards in time, and you describe quantum transactions as handshakes between the, the present and the future. Or, or transactions. The future and the past. Uh, information going back and forth, uh, uh, <coughs> causing, uh, <coughs> causing um, it, uh, Laws of physics to be to be observed and, 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 and conservation and, uh, laws to be to be re respected. Has has anybody heard a single sentence in this entire session that shouldn't wasn't worth going into for half an hour in its own right? <laughs> We're going to jump right past multiple universes, Gosh numbers, anthropic principles, evolution of universes, and get straight to the singularity because we right. have maybe three minutes to talk about it. Right. Um, are we going to become gods within, um, within the next uh, 20, 30, 40 years? Well, okay, a prominent science fiction writer, Werner Vinge, has uh, done, done a number of, of uh, fiction. He's been a guest here at FIRE. Ah, okay, so people know Werner, okay. It has suggested that the exponential growth in, in technology is in, in, in inevitably going to re, uh, reach a point where uh, everything changes in, in, in a completely unpredictable way. And, uh, things will, will be so dramatically changed that we, we, we wouldn't recognize them from this side. And it's called the singularity. Um, and the good singularity is promoted by guys like Ray Kurzweil, yeah, the, <laughs> some of these extropians who think that AI will, um, uh, doctors will cure all of our cells individually with nanoprobes and um, we're going to live forever and uh, become the better versions of the Borg with uh, access to all these Apple products embedded. <laughs> right. 
And who knows, they may be right. But. They may be right, but uh, <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't uh, give up some of the rationalizations we have for dealing with death. Um, My but feeling is that exponential growth always hits some kind of a limit, and I, I'm, always I'm always skeptical of exponential uh, extrapolations that are continued indefinitely. Well, especially since they're uh, based upon the personality types, that right. we're all, always in human civilizations. There were always transcendentalists who said, thus we get to a, a better realm than this one. There were always, as I deal with the SETI people, search for extraterrestrial intelligence, who are now beaming messages in space, and I'm involved in a big fight over that, completely separate matter. Um, but it's praying for salvation from above. Now, I'm not saying that that never works, but I am saying that um, we have been well served in Enlightenment civilization by learning to try to do as much as possible for ourselves. Which brings us to one last minute dealing with the notion of sci-fi predictions. I know you enjoyed uh, the, some of the predictive essays of Robert Heinlein right. and H.G. Wells. Yeah, in preparing for this, uh, this talk, I decided to see how other people had done in the, as science fiction writers in predicting things. And I discovered that H.G. Wells in, in 1901 uh, had uh, addressed the Royal Society with a talk entitled uh, The Discovery of the Future, in which he was uh, alleged to, have, uh, to be making predictions about the future. What he actually said was that uh, the future, it's not really very, uh, very reliable to, for science fiction writers to try to make predictions about the future except for one thing, namely that there's going to be change. Secondly, it's going to be change that you don't expect. And thirdly, that you should be well prepared uh, to adapt to those changes because they're going to come whether you adapt to them or not. Re resilience, and if I could add that, that some of the essays that you guys really should uh, look up in addition to these, um, both, uh, both um, uh, John and I on our websites will, will post uh, some additional reading, but some of the best uh, previews of the future were done by J.D. Bernal, The World, the Flesh, and the Devil, a famous essay back in the uh, 1930s that predicted space colonies and computers, and Vannevar Bush, um, a, an official for the United States government around the 19, late 40s, 50s, predicted Memex's access to information through computer networks um, uh, that look crudely, crude future peering visions of our t internet of today. So you will find some of these things in the future, and we are close to a minute over. Yeah, I would like to say one final thing. Yeah, uh, please, John. Namely, that uh, I was talking about this experiment that's sort of pushing the envelope of, of, of quantum mechanics in, a, in an interesting direction. Uh, my laser is failing. It's now producing about 20% of, of, of the rated output. It's two, year, two, two months out of warranty, and suddenly the, uh, the, the, the laser is going bad. So if, uh, if there are any people out there who are interested in making tax-free contributions uh, <laughs> to this project with no uh, university overhead except, uh, 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 extracted, I would be, <clears throat> be very interested in receiving Except we have to bear in mind that the laser may be failing because the universe does not want your well, that, that is that possibility that, that the universe doesn't want you to send messages backwards in time, and so it's doing something go. in my laser, yes. Well, let's hope that the, uh, <laughs> that the uh, universe wants us to proceed with the uh, solving the problems of our civilization, which is what the CTO guys are supposed to be back there getting ready to do. I'm going to stretch a little while I shake the hands of my good friend John Kramer.